I try to limit my exposure to Twitter as much as possible, but every now and then I will pop my head in there and take a look around uh, just before going, yeah, never mind, and then closing the door. But before I do that, uh, I may see a tweet from someone who I've been following for a long time and whose tweets I've always really appreciated. He's someone who's been uh, documenting the process of his own death. His tweets tend to follow a, a common pattern, which is he'll describe how he's feeling, which is usually not very good, and then he'll mention that he's offering up his suffering and his prayers for all of us. One of the reasons I like following his account is because it's a persistent reminder of the reality of death and the inevitability of my own death. And if I want to believe that my life has any meaning or purpose, as most people do, I have to somehow reconcile the reality and the inevitability of my own death within the whole scope of the meaning of my life. But if you're an atheist or an agnostic, there's very little you can do with that deliberation. There aren't any measures of hope or antidotes to despair against the fact that if this is all there is, then our life is merely a tragedy. So I wanted to challenge you, whatever walk of life you come from, with some wisdom from the tradition of Christianity. And it's something that in times of my own suffering, I've employed it and found huge consolation and meaning within it. And I, I just want to challenge you and even dare you to give it a try yourself. So let's start with considering the fact that how well you respond to the reality of suffering is a matter of courage or fortitude. The more courage you have, the more it will alleviate the, the negative aspects of suffering. But if you perceive or even believe that your suffering is inconsequential or meaningless, then a reason to have courage will be elusive to you. And then, as a result, your suffering will remain intact, but then you'll have the added undesirable addition of disillusionment and despair. But in Catholic Christianity, there's this notion that you can offer up your suffering to God, united in the suffering of Christ, who is incarnate among us, in part so that he could endure the same kind of suffering that we endure. And so you can offer it up to God for some good intention, like maybe the salvation of loved ones. And when you do this, two things are, are promised. One is that God will actually use that suffering for some good. And two, you will be fortified against the worst aspects of your own suffering. And if you can actually believe something like that, then when you offer your suffering up in the service of some greater good, suddenly it takes on a noble purpose that it didn't have before. And if you're anything like me, you will be much more willing to, to suffer some adversity if you know that it will benefit someone else who needs it. And that becomes an unrivaled source of encouragement from which we derive the needed courage and fortitude to endure our suffering. We are suddenly motivated to embrace our suffering rather than resist it uh, because it acquires a new meaning and a purpose that wasn't there otherwise. And resisting your suffering is a futile thing because suffering is inevitable whether we embrace it or not. So we have to find something that we can cling to that will give us the courage that we need to endure that suffering. And there's a principle within this that I think you'll be able to appreciate if you can understand how it applies within your own life. For example, myself as a parent, there's often times I have to deny myself something that I might want, like maybe an upgrade to my car or the opportunity to go to a nice restaurant with my wife. But because of the needs of my children, I often have to go without something that I may desire. And if it was merely meaningless self-denial, the kind of thing that poverty can appear to impose on people, that would be an easy thing to resent and that's it. But suddenly when I see the tuition, the clothes, the summer camps, the school books, and whatever good thing that my children are able to have because of that denial, it becomes something that far from being easy to resent is actually something that I'm grateful to have been able to experience. Like an equation, it converts suffering into something that you can actually be grateful for. And just speaking from my own experience, whenever I've had to endure a more acute or severe instance of grief or suffering, uh, like an injury or an illness, in my most grace-filled moments, I've been able to make that prayer. God, I, I offer this suffering up for some good intention that I might have in mind. Um, and that's something that I would pray for, for another person. And every time I've done that, I've been overcome by an otherworldly kind of courage and consolation. I found that it was much harder to resent my adversity and that the courage and encouragement I needed to suffer well was just available to me. Now, maybe you're a skeptical or atheistic type and you hear this and you think, well, this is just manipulating yourself into some sort of a good effect. But I'd offer you this consideration in reply. 
if you do something and it produces a truly good and desirable effect, in this case, the transformation of your suffering from something that is merely resentful into something that cultivates courage and even gratitude from within that suffering, then isn't that evidence that the thing that is being claimed is actually true? Suffering is obviously a, a pretty terrible thing, and it makes all the difference in the world in our quality of life if we can experience it well or merely in a way that we resent and then ultimately destroys us. If someone claims that they have some sort of an insight about your physical well-being, like let's say they, they say, if you observe this diet, you will experience longer periods of health without getting sick in between. And then if you try it and you find it works exactly as they promised, wouldn't you say that that's evidence that their claims are true? If what I propose can actually encourage you and redeem the experience of your own suffering, doesn't that suggest that this advice points to a greater truth, which is that this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing within our suffering, and that also the claims of Christianity are actually true? So if you're of more of a Protestant persuasion, you might be thinking, uh, this all sounds nice, but where is this in Scripture? And I would point you to a few places. The first is uh, Colossians 1.24. Uh, also Corinthians 12.15 and 2 Timothy 2.10. In these verses, St. Paul identifies his own suffering united with Christ as an offering for the benefit and even the salvation of others in the church. This indicates at least a couple of things that I want to point out. The first is that he's talking to the church. He's talking to people of faith, likely people who have been baptized. And he's admitting that his suffering is offered in the hope of of their salvation, which is to say that their salvation is not secure. It can be lost. The second is that according to St. Paul's example, we participate in Christ's saving sacrifice by suffering with and in his suffering in a mystical way. This means that there's nothing wrong with adding ourselves to the unique sacrifice that Christ offered on the cross. St. Paul even goes so far to say something that most Protestants will really struggle to reconcile, which is that he completes what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So he's saying that there's something missing that needs to be completed for that work of salvation. Hey, thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you are able to support the work I'm doing, there are a couple of ways you can do that. By donating through my website or by joining my online community, The Reinforcements. Both can be done by visiting brianholdsworth.ca, the .ca because that's how we internet in Canada. Members will have the opportunity to personally interact with myself and other community members, and certain levels will receive a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company whose beard bomb I'm wearing right now. Members also get free access to Christ-Centered Capital, which offers ethical investing tips that are in accord with Catholic beliefs. Even if you aren't able to support my work, consider checking both of them out at glorianshine.com and christcenteredcapital.com. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.